Hello, um, welcome to this interview. Um, I'm Franz Cecilia from GlobalNet21 and Infill Voices. And we often do these interviews to showcase and illustrate what people are doing in our local communities. Um, now, one of the big problems we have in the uh, 21st century is the problem of social care. We know that more and more people are living longer and many of them are in need of care and they don't have institutional care. They often have to be cared at home, but not, it's not just older people, people with disabilities and often even young people need care. And in order to get that care, we have to depend on an army, often an, a hidden army of, of care workers. And we're going to look at their work now, and the support and the help they can get. And the Enfield Carer Centre is a place in Enfield that works with carers to provide that advice and support. And we're going to talk to Danny Newland from that centre, and you'll see him in a minute. Um, before we start, let me say if you're on our webinar system, you can put your comments and your questions in the chat box on the right. And if you're watching this on the stream on Facebook, you can uh, put your comments below the stream window and we'll try and pick them up. Anyhow, Danny, thank you for uh, joining us today and for your time. So, um, you know, uh, maybe we could start by asking you if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got involved in work with carers. Okay, when I was 21, um, uh, I suffered cardiomyopathy and I needed a heart transplant. So I actually stayed around St. George's Hospital after receiving my new heart, helping people on the organ transplant list. Um, and then I realized that that's what I wanted to do actually was work with people. Uh, so I found myself volunteering for Barnet Carers Centre as a volunteer in 2006. Uh, and then I got a job supporting carers in uh, Barnet Hospital for two years on a project. And it just basically kept changing roles. So I worked with mental health, um, general uh, carer support, working around the boroughs, working with social services, um, the primary care trusts they were in them days, now it's the CCG. And that led me to me becoming an advocate for Enfield Carer Centre in 2013, and now I'm one of the management team here. So it's been a long, it's been a long ride to get to where I am, but uh, it's, it's all been focused around people. So tell us a, a bit about the Carer Centre. I mean, how big is it? How many people you, have you got involved? Don't go through everything you do because we'll do that in the interview. But basically, what's your purpose? Uh, basically, uh, our purpose in a nutshell is to identify uh, the carers that in, in Enfield. Most of them don't identify with that term. It's the legal term for an unpaid person, usually a family member who provides care. Uh, we anticipate on the last uh, census, there's about 40,000 um, carers in Enfield. We have about 6,000 uh, adult carers in our books, and we've got a few hundred uh, young carers now. So we want to identify them, and we want to offer them support in various ways. So we do all the traditional support, so we have things like support groups and counselling. Uh, we give benefit advice and other financial maximisation. Uh, we do like the carers' assessments. But um, what my personal aim is, is to give a carer somewhere they can phone and say, look, this is the situation I'm in what are my rights what choices do i have and to be able to actually give them them choices now usually there's no magic wand solution to things but i think if you're well informed and know what your choices are then at least you can make an informed decision about what what you want to do the sustainability of the caring role and things like that so that's that's what we we try to achieve for our teams in a nutshell we have various uh, you know teams doing various work so we have the young kids team which is known as enfield young people in caring the epic team uh, and my team that well, they're all my team now, but uh, the adult team tends to do things that are a bit more practical, like blue badge applications, uh, you know, uh, dealing with social services, uh, dealing with um, GPs, surgeries, hospitals, that kind of thing. Okay, well, well, we'll look at some of those things in a minute, but let's start by, I mean, you, you mentioned there are 40,000 carers in, in Enfield, and that's a huge number. I mean, what is meant by a carer? How would you define one? We, we use the legal definition just because it's the most simplest thing to us. Um, it, it's just someone that pays, uh, provides unpaid care. So um, from our kind of perspective, it doesn't have to be very much, actually. It's just once a week emotional support, uh, you know, you're just helping a neighbour. That technically is a carer. Obviously, when it comes to getting statutory support in or looking at certain rights, the benefits and other things, there has to be a, a certain level of care being provided. But we, that's what we mean by care. Now, we know it's a term that people don't really associate with. When you, we come to different communities in Enfield, there's certain languages that don't 
even have a word that's the equivalent of carer. Um, and, and to be honest with you, usually that you're, you're a daughter or a mom, a son, brother, um, and we know it's a term that alienates actually, but we, we can't find a better one for it. Obviously, we don't say, oh, hello, carer, when we get to know people, we use names uh, as a preference, but we, we use the legal term just for convenience, really. Well, you've, you've talked about the 40,000 carers, but it's probably um, the, uh, the, the problem's much bigger than that than, than reflected in the number of, um, you know, identified carers. I mean, how big a problem do you think social care is in our society today and in Enfield particularly? Um, I mean, I, I, uh, I, I see it from both sides. I was, I've been supporting carers um, professionally, I guess, uh, for, for over a decade now. And things were much easier, but Barnet, um, it, it became very difficult. Uh, things were taken over, being able to give support became much more difficult. When I come to Enfield, it was actually refreshing uh, to be able to support people again in the old fashioned way and getting help. But it is getting uh, more and more difficult. So, uh, one of the biggest issues we have is if it doesn't exist on paper, it doesn't exist. So, I think it's very easy for people to make assumptions, say, when they're having like a social care assessment or a person centered needs assessment. Um, to, to just assume that social services are going to know what they need. But actually, if it's not in the assessment, there's no um, guarantee there's going to be a provision for it. Uh, and we have to make sure that everything's written down now. Um, a lot of things for additional funding go to funding panels. And we have to obviously make sure that um, managers who may never meet the families have all the information in front of them to make decisions when it comes to budgets. Um, so it, it's, getting, it's getting tougher. Um, and I think, it, you know, for an opinion, that's because there's a number of there's like an empowerment agenda where there's a lot of push on on helping people to do more by encouragement um but that sometimes crosses over to actually letting them get on with it which you know is sometimes a you know not the wisest thing to do with, with certain groups especially with things like mental health but when i was talking about how big a problem it is i mean some people say that there's a lot more a lot more there are many more carers out there than the statutory and the voluntary bodies can deal with, and they're often called hidden carers. I mean, do you recognise that term, hidden carers? We, we do. Uh, I mean, yeah, hard to reach community and hidden carers. It, it's um, it's what we one part of the job we do is the identification of, of hidden carers. Uh, so we we think that probably about when the stats are three in five people will um, be a carer at some point, even if it's only for a short period of time. Um, you know, we, we know that there's a lot, a lot the figures actually are guessing from the last census it's due to, to happen again we know that it's probably increased because of uh, the, the less provision that's being provided by social services uh, you know we, we it, it, is, it is a growing it is a growing issue with the amount of carers there and the level of care that they're providing actually so how how do you actually identify hidden carers what's the process you use we, we just, we promote, so we're, we're linked in with social services and we're, we're looking at services that people may, even if they don't actually think of themselves as carers, will probably naturally, uh, you know, find themselves in. So we work with GP surgeries, we have an officer that goes around GPs, we work at the main hospitals, so we have projects at the North Middlesex, Barnet and Chase Farm, um, and, and we're just trying to make staff aware. Uh, and, and there's a crossover, there's like care workers and carers are, are two very different things, but the, the term gets used um, you know, quite a lot, even by professionals, it, it becomes like a money issue. So you'll see things that in the papers, you'll see like carer does this when it's actually a care worker that's that's done that. And it, it just makes it a bit harder for us to sort of like promote to, to carers. But it's, yeah, it's, it's difficult. I, I mean, carers are voluntary. And do you think many people just think, ah, oh, it's, it's something the statutory body should do and they don't understand the huge pool of voluntary support there is for carers. Um, I think it's just the natural. It's it's just such a difficult um, role that uh, being a carer. Carers often want to do it, and the trouble is, we you know the state of caring survey is actually going on right now. So uh, Carers UK do a state of caring survey and looking at the impacts of care. And you can actually, if you Google it now, if you're a carer, you can feed into the national kind of challenges that carers face. But the last one um, highlighted that about 61% of carers report with physical ill health due to their caring role, and 72% uh, mental illness, uh, which they felt was a result of their, their caring role. And it's about actually the support that's required. I think there's about one point, uh, I think about seven billion pounds of 
carers allowance is unclaimed. Um, people don't do it for that. But if you don't balance your lifestyle, if you don't balance your caring role um, with your life goals and your own needs, it breaks down. It's like what it becomes like work. And if you just work constantly, you're going to become unwell. And that's really what the issue is. So the Care Act um, provides a duty on the local authority to actually support carers. Um, it's the first time that it's actually been a, a legal um, expectation that that will happen. It's always, it's always has happened before, but it's usually just been in a kind of informal type of way. Now it's in law. Um, so, so, so are you saying that, um, you know, carers are now beginning to have rights and that's, that's sort of enshrined in law? And what rights is it that they have? Well, carers have rights, but it, it, it's, it's a mixed bag, really. Carers have the right to have their own needs assessed. So they have a right to care assessment regardless of whether they're self-funding situations and all the level of care that's provided. Same as the person with the level who has the needs. They have a right to be assessed regardless of their wealth and regardless of their level of need. You can ask for that assessment. But the biggest protection that carers have is that actually that ultimately, if you care for someone over the age of 18, you're not legally responsible for providing the care. Um, but that's not very helpful. It, it, you know, if um, you've got inadequate provision or maybe you're not satisfied with how much support you've been put in for, for your mum, say, um, it's very difficult to say, well, it's not really my legal duty to do anything. And you're going to find you're, you're filling the gaps. And then over time, you're filling more gaps. And if you say, or you agree to anything, um, that's perfectly acceptable. So if you say, oh, I'll do that, um, it, it might be fine for a month, it might be fine for two months, but if you actually have not thought about the sustainability of actually doing that, it, it can become an issue over time. And that's what the care, uh, care assessment actually, it's a tool that we use and, and we, we do um, that on behalf of the local authority is to try and identify how the caring role is impacting actually on someone's own personal needs and goals and health. And that's okay, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you about the assessment in a minute, but you know, we often think of carers as being a relative of someone who is in need of care, often a spouse. Um, I mean, with all those carers out there, do you think a lot of them still don't understand there's an organization, organization like the Carer Center, they don't realize that there is some support they can get and they go on working alone without that. I think, I think that's true, yeah. Uh, we, we sometimes get carers come to us and say, oh, well, I never even knew you were here. I mean, we've, we've been here uh, in some form. I mean, Enfield Mental Health Carers has been here since 2000, um, uh, year 2000, so almost 20 years now. Um, we merged with, so that organization merged with Enfield Carer Center as it was in 2013. So as, as an organization like this, we've been here for, uh, since 2013. So there's always been sort of like some support for carers. Um, but when we're not, we're not spotting them all. And it's, it's, you may think, you know, you're right, but it's very important that you do because there's, there's actually quite poor information that can be given sometimes. If you get the right social worker or you get the right advice person, they give you good advice. If you don't, you can sometimes get the wrong advice. And if you haven't got someone just saying, well, actually, no, this is um, per perhaps how it should be, you can go off for, for quite a long time. Uh, I remember a carer once come here and was told that she wasn't eligible for a benefit. Um, do you know when you do like the information market fairs where there's a number of stalls? Um, but when she explained the situation, it was quite clear to me that she should have been claiming it. You know what I mean? And we pick up these things with people interacting with our groups. Now, we know that people are busy but you know we we understand that but we are a phone call away and if people just you know give us a ring we can just go over what they may already know you know i, I don't know if i can i'm entitled to any help i don't know if I, we can say yeah we don't we, we agree we don't think there's much we can do but sometimes there, there's things that we can uh, spot but when, when, when you contact a new carer or new carers out there, um, are they sort of relieved and, you know, pleased that there's help around? Or do you find some are stubborn and say, you know, this is my business, I, I want to do it alone? Um, I think there's a natural distrust when you, you look at kind of uh, remedies. So um, usually the voluntary sector, because of the way um, you know, we operate, people tend to be a little bit more trusting of us so obviously it, it, you know, we are talking about private matters and we do try to encourage people down so when people register with us we often invite them in for a cup of tea um just so it's like i oh, was standing from the carer center rather than this person phone up and asking you all these uh, quite personal questions uh, you know about your, your what you do and i think that there's more mistrust generally for social workers um because people think that these assessments that we're trying to do is an assessment like like a test 
you know are you caring well enough when actually the assessment is to, to look at how support can be offered to sustain the role only um, but people are especially with things like young carers um, they don't want to divulge that they're reliant on, on a young person for care because they feel it's somehow a judgment on the family but actually all we're interested in is, is, is getting extra support into health really. So to tell us a bit more about the assessment I know you have to make an assessment um, I mean, how, how are they assessed? I mean, what is the sort of questions you ask? What is it you want to know? We, we basically, uh, there is a framework to the question, but it, it's meant to be a therapeutic process in itself. And actually the feedback I get from carers is, is that's what it is. So you'll come in, you have a talk, and it's just a chat like we're having now, but the questions will be guided to look at how the caring role impacts on the other relationships that you have. You know, you have the relationship with the person you care for, uh, sometimes in the sandwich generation, there might be you know, multiple people you care for. How does that interfere with your other relationships, your, your ability to socialise, your personal energies, your ability to pursue career, uh, training, or, or even just your hobbies? So, so what is it with you? How's your health? How are you doing? Um, and when I was based at Barnet Hospital, um, I remember that there was a carer and she had a mum and dad in at the same time. And I, the first thing I said to her is, how are you getting on? And she burst into tears and said it was the first time that someone had actually after that, it's all been about mum and dad. Now, we respect that, obviously, the care for is important and the needs have to be met. But, you know, no one's superhuman. I've met some marvellous carers. I mean, how they do it, I, I don't know. But if you, if you do too much, too long, it's going to wear you down and, uh, eventually. So, do, do you, when you, you're working with carers, do you also work in partnerships with the local authority, the health authorities, other voluntary organisations, so that maybe you can develop a, an integrated package of care around the person, which gives the person who's being cared for a sort of holistic form of care, and also gives the carer an understanding that there is support and help from other agencies as well? Yes, that's what we, all, we always aim to, to work with as many agencies or give that option for support as we can. So the carer's assessment is actually a statutory tool. It's used um, and it's, it's basically loaded up to the social uh, care system. So we do what's known as, um, at for care centres, we do what's known as um, non-complex standalone assessments, which basically means we, we can't be as holistic. Social workers have the choice of actually doing a joint assessment. Um, and this is, we're talking about people that are 18, uh, caring for other people over the age of 18 because for children it's, it's a slightly different framework under law and it's always a, a, like a holistic uh, joint assessment. Um, so basically we work with all of the local organisations that we can, so we work with CAB, Enfield Connections, Enfield Disability Action, CAPE, um, and, and we try to make sure that the person's getting the right um, service for them. Uh, and also that the standard information that they're getting from us is exactly the same. So we, we call it like the gateway in. And, um, you know, we would make sure that social that, that they're prepared. As an advocate, the background of advocacy, I've, I've always tried to explain to carers what I think they should be, you know, voicing to, um, to social services to make sure that their needs are highlighted. Okay. And, uh, you know, you provide a number of other services as well, don't you? Maybe you could tell us about some of them. For example, you have a have a break scheme. What is that? I'm sorry, Francis. A hub? Have a break scheme. Oh, have a break scheme. Things, yeah. We, we, yeah, we have an, uh, social opportunities for carers as well. So we actually provide respite uh, opportunities. So that'd be anything from cinema. Uh, I think we've got quite a big trip to, uh, we're sending people to co by coach to Germany. Um, it, it, this month, I believe. I mean, that's, we don't we don't do that often. But we have funding that we, we sometimes secure in. Um, so yeah, it's, it tends to be nights out um, around that and chance to socialise with other carers because we do do things like support groups, but they're really not everyone's cup of tea. And sometimes people really just want to get out and, and and forget about the caring role and just you know relax. So we we run that that scheme. It changes from month to month. So, I mean, what are the support groups? Are they, you know, self-help groups that you get together or are they groups that uh, exist for specific things like money matters? How do you develop them and how do you put people into these groups? The support groups that we do here tend to be on the type of caring that you provide. So we have um, a dementia uh, carers group, mental health carers group, um, autism carers uh, group, and then we have a, a coffee morning. Now, um, one of the, sorry, there's a couple of other groups we do as well. I'll just mention we do a bereavement group as well 
for people that are, you know, are no longer carers. And we do the care home network. Now, even though people that have put someone into a care home are technically no longer carers, they, they still are. Actually. And it's, it's usually they're just running around to different places and there's a whole different type of stress. So we also provide that service. Now, the reason that these groups tend to be uh, better than just like a generic physical and sensory impairment group is there's often a lot of um, similarities between the, the experiences of providing that sort of care. So if you're caring for someone with psychosis, it's not exactly the same, but there's going to be similarities between the way that you feel and some of the challenges you might face. And that helps, obviously, a group bond, where with physical and sensory, um, you tend to just have people that care for someone that has physical conditions, but there's no common ground some of the time. So we do things like coffee mornings for that, that type of thing. Okay, I mean, it, when we talk about caring, we often think of elderly people caring elderly people, but very often young people are carers, aren't they? And you have a young carer scheme, don't you? I mean, do you want to tell us about that and, and you know, the number of young carers there probably are? Um, it's a bit hard to tell, actually. I mean, we, we support carers from the ages of five up, uh, and I was reading just the other day that there's been a huge increase in the amount of uh, level of care that children as young as five and seven. It's, it's estimated about one in 12 uh, secondary school children are uh, young carers. We don't really have a clear idea of the numbers of younger than that. And as I say, it's often uh, masked by families that don't want to sort of say, well, actually, I'm, I'm a little bit more reliant on my uh, young, young children as I, as I would like to be. Um, um, but there's other issues as well. We, we go into schools and schools are under tremendous pressure. I mean, we, we recognise the pressures that are under all organisations that are in the borough and we try and do our bit to, to facilitate and help with that. But for example, Ofsted are consulting now to try and remove young carers as a vulnerable group in their inspection, which, which means that schools wouldn't prioritise them. And if, you've, if you're trying to look at your, your resources, you're going to put them into areas where you do have to prioritise. So we're kind of fighting the tide on that, we feel. Um, the way that we support the children is we, we, we assess, we obviously provide more holistic support in we try and help families uh, to address things to take some of the pressure off of the kids. We liaise with the schools, um, we do homework clubs, we have the tutors coming in for the SATs that are coming up. Um, so we, we try to address that imbalance because usually they tend to fall behind the school because they're, they're tired and, and doing other things. Often get bullied a lot, so we often uh, you know try and go to schools to make sure there's no issues like that that's going on as well as the hubs which is the usual sort of like giving them a chance to, to, to muck about and play a bit okay so you do all that which is you know fantastic but and you, and you talk about the support you give but you were telling us that you also you know give advice and you do counseling now how do you organize that because you can't be experts on all the topics that people need advice on so what's the process of giving advice and, and even moving into a counseling uh, environment as well how, how have you organised that and how have you involved others in helping you do that? Right, um, I mean, the way, the way I see it, we offer three tiers of emotional support. So the first one is if a carer comes in distress, one of us will speak to them. So we'll have a chat uh, as I'm talking to you now. And that's just the really low level, low grades. Sometimes people just need to then uh, be listened to and, uh, and have someone say, look, I understand. It can be enough. The second is what is the peer support elements offered by the support groups. And in the third, we refer into the counselling. Now, even though counselling is part of us, it's actually run by a, a counselling coordinator who's, who's qualified. Uh, and our counsellors are, are going through the qualifications. They have to do so many hours to, to qualify up. So they are, but they are to a level that's, that's acceptable. We also work with IAPS, which is improved access to psychological therapies to run certain wellbeing groups. So if I was to refer someone to counselling, even though it's in-house, it would kind of end there for me and then go over to that counselling side. I wouldn't have access to anything that they talk about in the counselling or things like that. It, it's just, it just moves on, but it's, it's an in-house service. Okay, I mean, you, you also talked about how you work with other organisations in delivering services, but it is, at a strategic level, you also work with partnership boards, don't you, to develop the service in a, 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 a cross, joined up way? Uh, yeah, we're active with the Learning Disability Partnership Board, Older Adults, Mental Health. So that's where, uh, you know, all, all of the main groups in the community come together, you know, with stakeholders at the CCG. And we just kind of try and feed back to the carers. We use the things like carers ambassadors, who are, you know, champions by experience, really. Uh, they go to these meetings as well and feedback the experience of being a carer. Because we try and 
we're trying to understand and we can i think I, I think it'd be fair to say i understand what it's like to be a carer but but i can't know it um and i think that sometimes having that insight is very important to the community and we, we try to you know put carers onto these boards so they can feed back as well uh, so for example there's this concept called disability related expenditure uh, that's coming out and there's some new paperwork and i you know we've been involved as long along with ED, Enfield Disability Action, Enfield Connections, CAB, make sure that that paperwork's adequate and it's been expanded. And we did the first training session here to try and inform um, carers about this concept. Because the things are, these concepts are not difficult in themselves if you know them, but actually you just have to get your head around them a bit. And uh, sometimes even I, I think to myself, oh, that's quite an easy explanation. And I explain it and then realise that someone's completely not got what I'm trying to say. So we work to try and develop these training tools as well. Okay, um, you uh, talked earlier, you mentioned earlier the importance of advocacy. I mean, how do you get uh, people who are carers to, you know, be advocates for their own rights, for what they should be getting? How, impo how important is it you for, for you to develop a sort of pressure group side to what you do in, in your advocacy programme? I mean, I mean, it's. I mean, advocacy. Um, I think it's it's getting growing growing recognition now. Um, the the thing is, for things like Care Act advocacy, you have to have a substantial difficulty in communication. But I would argue that actually being emotionally invested in this situation does impede what how you you comment. You're probably going to be quick to frustration. You're probably going to be quick to anger. You're probably they're going to go into a meeting you know, rant and then forget to actually say the thing that you wanted to say. So, the, you know, what, one of the things that we do here is um, it enfocuses the action and the, the, the commissioned advocates in the area, but we do advocacy training um, where we, we try to get carers to think about what they're trying to say and communicate it in, in a clear way, often sometimes before the meeting, having it written down. So um, there's, there's meetings on the mental health boards, for instance, called uh, Care Plan Approach Meetings. So that's as, as someone that's, that's acutely unwell but coming off the wards. Um, they would have their discharge planning uh, sorted out via this meeting. And I, I've been to a number of these on behalf of carers. But the meetings can quickly break down because the person's coming out, the carer will start saying, I'm really concerned about them coming home. That will start an argument with the person that you cared for. Uh, and then the meeting breaks down before you've actually discussed even what you really wanted to do. So what I would actually do is get the carers to write exactly what they were concerned about. So if the, if the issue becomes contentious, because if you... Uh, answered by professional after the meeting without causing that um, disruption or ill feeling between the cared for. There's these techniques you can use just to make communication easier. Yeah. So, I mean, there may be many communities and social networks out there, community groups who might want to connect with you because they think they can help in one way or the other in what you do. Um, I mean, how, how can they do that? How can they connect with you to help? I, I mean, we, we, we are we've been around for a while we we like to work with uh, any any organization that wants to work so it's just uh, give us a call on, on our, our number and we will talk um you know we let people use our room uh you know if, if there's meetings so uh, i can which is a service by age uk uh, they used to come in here and provide services on here so to be honest with you if anyone's interested in working with us for them we our doors open and we'll, we'll come in and have a chat really and what about individuals who say, who say, look, I'd like to help out by being a carer? I mean, do you accept volunteers who want to care? And can you help them develop um, the caring skills they need and be able to place them in areas where they'd be useful? I mean, obviously, carers tend to be within a family unit and things like that. But we do um, provide training for carers uh, prior to the council. So we, we do things like first aid training, uh, manual handling training, um, and, and sometimes we get opportunities to do other other types of training as well. So that could be mental health. I know that I was talking to the complex mental health team and they wanted us to look into um, working with people that care for those with uh, post-traumatic stress um, disorder um, because they often need to be grounded quite quickly if they start to revert back to that, that panic feeling of, of the incident or whatever is the stress. And we were discussing that, you know, if we could show carers how to to ground that person by getting back in the here and now. So there is training opportunities that come up, but most of it's about things like the advocacy training, um, the, the first aid and, and manual handling is probably the one that you'll see again and again. We're doing some basic computer training as well uh, for our carers, uh, just, just to help those, because everything's moving online, to be honest with you, actually trying to get something done 
just by popping down the Civic is kind of not as easy as it used to be. So we, we're trying to help with that as well. So all those people could contact you through your website, online, your telephone number, or pop into the Care Centre, is that right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we're always happy to work with community. Okay, well, thanks very much. I mean, I think we've sort of come to the end of the interview now, and that was really, really interesting. And you obviously do um, some really fantastic work. And I think people know more about the extent of that work and the intricacies of that work from what you said. So thank you for joining us, Danny. And um, it's been a really, really good interview. Thanks, Francis. It was nice to speak to you. Okay, thanks. Well, we'll uh, finish this uh, interview now. <laughs>